The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Sami Shah. This is Ear to Asia. Perhaps K-pop or Korean dramas is a good motivator to attract students at the beginning to learn the Korean language. But on the long run, it is not a good motivator to keep them going until they reach high proficiency level. This is perhaps the problem that people like Shinji and myself have to fix. So heritage language learners will have their family members, close by parents, siblings, or maybe even extended family members in Korea with whom they can actually use the language every day. And for foreign language learners, it might be harder, slightly harder to find someone to have regular conversations with in Korean. In this episode, the Korean language abroad, who's learning it and why? Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialists at the University of Melbourne. Korean, once a language primarily confined to the Korean Peninsula, has seen a remarkable rise in popularity and influence. From the global phenomenon of K-pop to the growing interest in Korean dramas and films, the Korean language has become a symbol of a dynamic and innovative culture. And reflecting that newfound status, more people, both those with ethnic Korean backgrounds and those with none at all, are enrolling in Korean language courses. Yet, as we'll hear, choosing to learn Korean and staying the course to fluency are two different things. Meanwhile, the Korean diaspora, scattered across the globe, faces unique challenges in preserving their linguistic heritage. As generations pass, Korean as the language spoken at home risks becoming a relic of the past, lost amidst the pressures of assimilation and the allure of dominant languages. So, who's committing to learning the Korean language and what motivates them? What constitutes success and how many will go on to reach fluency? And for those with Korean roots who speak it at home in places like the US or Australia, what are the factors that determine how well the language survives? Joining me to discuss are long-time observers of the Korean language scene, Dr. Nicola Fraschini, Senior Lecturer in Korean Studies, and Dr. Shin Chi Chong, Lecturer in Korean Studies, both from Asia Institute. Welcome to Air to Asia, Nicola and Shin Chi. Thank you for inviting us and nice to meet you. Hello, Sammy. Thank you for having me. Let's kick things off then with a very basic question. Shinchi, I'll start with you. Could you provide an overview of how widely Korean is spoken within diaspora families and communities around the world? Okay, so this is actually a difficult question to answer simply because the Korean diaspora is spread across the world and the situation for Korean diaspora in each region or country is quite unique due to different migration histories. It might be best to start with the number of Korean diasporas in the world. So according to statistics published biennially by the South Korean government, there are over 7 million Koreans living outside the Korean peninsula. So the South Korean government refers to them as Jewe Dongpo and translates it simply as overseas Koreans. Its statistics include South Korean citizens who live uh, temporarily or permanently outside their country and immigrants who have obtained foreign citizenships as well as their descendants. The latter actually also includes ethnic Koreans who left the peninsula even before the establishment of the two Korean governments. So according to its latest statistics, there were 2.6 million Koreans in the United States, 2.1 million in China, and 800,000 in Japan as of December 2022. Additionally, there were 650,000 in Europe and 520,000 across South Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific region combined. So many of these Korean diasporas would speak Korean regularly in certain domains of their lives, such as at home or in their local Korean communities. 
Uh, however, it's difficult to generalize or view this as the norm for their Korean language use across countries or time periods. The Korean diaspora in one country can be very different from that in another. Just think about Korean diaspora in Japan who moved there before or maybe during the Japanese colonial period and remained there after Korea's liberation. Their experience is very, very different from that of Koreans who moved to Hawaii or California around the same time. The two groups experienced very different political and social changes, uh, which influenced their language use. And their experiences might again be very, very different from those who moved to areas in China or Russia near the Korean border. So even within a single country, a language use among the Korean diaspora can be very, very different between times. For instance, what ethnic Koreans in Japan experienced in the 1950s, shortly after Korea's liberation, would be uh, very different from what uh, recent Korean immigrants in Japan experience these days. So even until the 1990s, ethnic Koreans in Japan, often referred to as Chinese Koreans faced a hostile social atmosphere. However, attitudes in Japan towards Koreans, especially towards South Korea and its people, have improved, especially in the past two decades. So Korean families who move to Japan today will experience much more friendly and maybe even a welcoming atmosphere. There's still an issue that the Japanese society holds different attitudes towards Chinese Koreans and recent Korean immigrants, distinguishing them as old comers and newcomers. But this simply tells us that even within the same country, the language use of the Korean diaspora can vary greatly depending on the time. Nicola, can you tell us then, has the Korean language found a home outside of the Korean peninsula? We've got the diaspora community that's just been described, but what about non-diaspora people? What about people who aren't even Korean? Well, if, if we think of the diaspora community as already a home, I would say that the home has got bigger over the past 10 to 15 years. My own personal experience, when I started learning Korean about 20 years ago in Italy, I remember we were less than 10 students in my university. And now, even here at the University of Melbourne, we enroll more than 300 students in our Korean one classes every year. Now, those 300 students don't all get to attain a high proficiency level. They, they don't stay with us until the end of the three years. But that's another problem that I think we'll touch with other questions later. Shinji, if you can expand on a particular concern here, which is Korean as a community language. In which countries is Korean considered a community language? And what does that designation entail? What does it mean when you say community language? So in Australia, this term refers to languages other than English spoken by migrants and their communities. So it's important to understand that this term acknowledges and recognizes that these languages as not just foreign languages, but as languages actively spoken and used within Australian communities. In this sense, the languages of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples could also be considered community languages. However, due to to the special status of these languages reflecting their heritage and rights, or we set them apart from community languages and refer to them as indigenous languages. So when we return to the question, uh, where is Korean considered a community language? If we interpret this as asking about places where a sizable number of Koreans reside, interact with one another, and maybe use Korean, then the answer would be, I'd say, many countries around the world. But how many countries exactly, or which one, then uh, that would be very difficult to answer. But one statistic that offers some insight would be the number of countries where Korean community language schools, known as Hangurakyo, operate. So presence of such schools suggests that the community is uh, quite sizable and invests a concerted effort in teaching Korean to its children. So as of April last year, there were over 1,400 Hangurakyo operating in 114 countries. 
And as we know, South Korea and North Korea are the only two countries in the world where Korean is designated as an official language. So outside the Korean peninsula, Korean is spoken by immigrants and ethnic minorities. Some countries have positive attitudes towards a language maintenance for migrant or ethnic groups and support it through various policies and programs. However, in most cases, the responsibility for retaining their language usually falls on the migrants themselves. So language maintenance efforts often require the collective efforts of the Korean community. So just think about how a Korean community language school, in, for example, in Australia would operate. Both the teachers and students are a part of the Korean community. If no one volunteers to teach or if, you know, the Korean migrant parents don't want to send their children to school, then it wouldn't be possible to operate, even with sufficient funding, classrooms and, and curriculum, textbooks, everything is in place. So we can say that a strong and active Korean community is crucial for fostering language retention. And if the host country or society supports uh, these efforts, as is the case, I'd say, in Australia compared to other uh, countries, then the goal of retaining the language can be achieved more easily, assuming other conditions are equal. I think that Shinji made a very important point that Korean has been perceived as a community language. And for a language in order to survive within its diaspora community overseas, there must be support from the community itself. If possible, like in the case of Korea, support from the home country, but there must be positive support and reception as well in the host country, like for Australia, as Shinji mentioned. I would like to expand a bit on what's the implication for learners of Korea who are not ethnic Korean, who do not belong to the overseas community. My personal view is that at this moment in Australia, Korea is a bit at a crossroad. And I would like to make the comparison with Japanese, if possible. And the problem is within the perception of who should be the speakers of a community language. If in Australia, the common perception is that fostering community languages is for the speakers belonging to those communities. And that's the way as Korean has been probably perceived so far. In that case, that could be also a barrier for other people to learn that language, for people who do not belong to that community. And the case I wanted to make with Japanese is that Japanese language is widespread in Australian schools. A lot of people learn Japanese. While on the other end, Korean students are increasing. But if you look at absolute numbers, they are really minimal compared to Japanese or other Asian languages. And probably that's because of the perception. So Japanese is not perceived as a community language, the way Korean is perceived by community language and spoken by Korean. So my personal belief is that in order for Korean to become more thought in Australian schools, for example, there must be a shift of perception. So looking at Korean, not just as a community language learned by ethnic Korean, the children of the diaspora, but as a wider additional language and a language additional to your, your repertoire. Well, Shinji, then it does raise the question, if we're talking about diaspora communities particularly and the impact they might have on community languages, how does something like, say, intermarriage within diaspora communities impact the retention of Korean across generations? So when a Korean person is partnered with a non-Korean spouse who doesn't speak Korean, then the language of communication between them or, you know, within the family is likely to be a language other than Korean, in most cases, English in Australia. Then naturally, children growing up in such a household have fewer opportunities to be exposed to and use Korean. And this leads to a lower chance of learning the language, which in turn results in say, a lower likelihood of the language being retained between generations. 
In fact, research shows that in the second generation, so in the second generation Korean migrants, children with both parents born overseas, so presumably in Korea, show much lower language shift rates compared to those with only one parent born overseas. Furthermore, among those with only one parent born overseas, presumably, you know, children of uh, intermarriage, the language shift rates are higher when the father is born overseas, presumably in Korea, than when the mother is. In other words, when only one parent speaks Korean, the language is generally better retained in children when the Korean speaking parent is the mother rather than it is the father. So this trend has been quite common across most migrant communities in Australia and around the world. What this tells us is that for a Korean parent partnered with someone who doesn't speak Korean, it will be more challenging to ensure their children learn and maintain Korean compared to a Korean parent partnered with another Korean speaker. In addition, if a family follows traditional gender roles in parenting, you know, where the father is usually the breadwinner and the mother is the homemaker and primary caregiver, then a family with a Korean father partnered with a non-Korean speaker will find it much more difficult to ensure intergenerational language retention compared to a family with a Korean mother partnered with a non-Korean speaker. Before we move on to learners of Korean outside of Korea, which is our main focus here today, I just want to spend a little bit more time breaking down the diaspora element, particularly in what ways have language practices among the Korean diaspora diverged from contemporary language use in South Korea itself today? Again, the answer will vary for every Korean diaspora group. If we consider ethnic Koreans in China, often called Chosonjok, they trace their roots to the northern part of North Korea, and their language reflects regional variations, particularly the Hamgyong or Pyongan dialects. There had been little interaction between ethnic Koreans in China and South Koreans until the 1990s. So the Korean spoken by these ethnic Koreans in China was quite different from standard South Korean, which is based on the Seoul dialect, as well as from other South Korean dialects. Moreover, the Korean spoken by ethnic Koreans in China has been influenced by both North Korean and Chinese due to geographical, political, and social contexts. As a result, their version of Korean differs from South Korean in terms of pronunciation, grammar, vocabulary, and orthography. However, differences, you know, has been always very small. It has always been mutually intelligible with both North and South Korean dialects. And additionally, since South Korea and China established diplomatic ties in 1992, the Korean language used by ethnic Koreans in China has been influenced by the standard South Korean dialect, especially through, you know, exposure to South Korean media. So it will be quite interesting to see how the variety of Koreans spoken by future generations of ethnic Koreans in China will evolve. And if we turn the question to the Korean community in Australia, the differences in language use between them and the people in South Korea might be very minimal. This is primarily because a large percentage of the Korean community arrived in Australia after 2000. This has been the age of mobile phones and the internet, as well as more affordable international travel and shipping. So Korean migrants can easily communicate with family and friends in South Korea via phone or internet and access South Korean media and find Korean resources online, whether for work or just for leisure. They can even, uh, you know, have Korean books shipped to their homes in Australia, though many of them may prefer electronic books nowadays, which are readily available. So the Korean community in Australia may incorporate English words when speaking Korean or maybe, quote, switch between the two languages. It's simply because most of them are bilingual or even multilingual speakers. The extent of this practice might depend on their proficiency in the two languages that they can speak. 
And heritage speakers, maybe it's called them second generation or children of the Korean immigrant families, may have uh, you know, some particular accent when they speak Korean or maybe follow specific patterns when borrowing Korean words in their English sentences. But this is mainly due to the interaction between English and Korean in bilingual speakers. So far, uh, so no distinctive differences have been reported between English-speaking heritage speakers of Korean in different countries, let's say the US, Australia, New Zealand, or the UK. Let's focus now then on learners of Korean outside of Korea. Nicola, who is learning Korean and why? Uh, it depends on what historical period you refer to. As you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, uh, the booming of Korean language learners is fairly recent. And before that, who was learning Korean? Well, until the 80s or until the early 90s, most learners of Korean were probably military personnel dispatched to Korea, missionaries, and perhaps some spy that wanted to learn the language. And that shift after the 90s and at the beginning of the 2000s, and so the population have been growing is increasingly diverse. If you go to study Korean to a Korean institute in South Korea in the 90s, probably your classmates would have been, most of them would have been Japanese students. And some of them, those Japanese students with Korean heritage that Shinji mentioned before. But if you go there now, you see people from all over the world. And the interest that have been attracting the students has been different. Like for military personnel or uh, missionaries, you can see that it is for job purposes, not for any other reason. They needed Korean in order to carry on their job. While now the difference is that perhaps most of learners of Korean, beyond probably the heritage learners that Shinji mentioned before, now one of the main reasons is just for fun, because they like it. And there is nothing wrong in learning a language just because you like it. 20 years ago, as I said, there are not that many foreign students of Korean and not many outside of Asia. So many Koreans used to ask me, why do you learn Korean? And they said, just because I like it. So is it safe to assume then that today, just focusing on the current situation, that primarily the motivation behind non-heritage learners, you know, non-ethnic Korean learners is fun is, you know, being inspired by K-pop or just being particularly interested, for example? No, I think it's not safe. <laughs> I think it's not safe. Uh, the fact that it's, it's fun, I, I said fun, but the fun doesn't necessarily come from K-pop. And when I did my own research on Korean language learning motivation, because in order to teach them, you need to know what motivates them. So I conducted different pieces of research about high school learners motivation and university learners motivation. So this has been done in other countries as well. And what is possible to see is that at least for the Australian case, we could see students that study the language either for an interest in the culture and here where you can put those uh, K-pop or Korean wave fan students. But it's not all of them. There are so many other students that just like probably I was myself, I was just interested in the language. So there are students that are just interested in mastering the language to a high level of proficiency who are not necessarily involved or interested in K-pop or K-dramas. But also Korea has a lot of global companies. Somebody labeled Korean middle power. And so being fluent in Korean can be a gateway to a better job. For somebody who wants to work, for example, in international organization or in the diplomatic field. And there is also another group of students that I found who is perhaps the most interesting that told me that they were studying Korean just to become more multicultural, more multilingual, and overall a more knowledgeable person. And they said that studying Korean for them was just a part of their plan to study more languages and to become a better person. So you can see that it is not all related to K-pop. And also, as I said before, this is different from country to country. What they just said was very relevant to students in Australia. 
but I recently tried to do the same research in a Chinese university. In the Chinese university, motivation were quite different. In Chinese university, sometimes you get to a university not because you like the major that you do, but because with your university entrance score, you can get to that university into that major and that the university which is best ranked for you. And so we found out that for a group of students in Chinese universities, some of them were really motivated by the Korean culture factor that you mentioned before. But a good bulk of the students said that they were just learning Korean because with the university score they had, that was the best department, the best university they could get into. And so if we try to do this in other universities, for example, I remember a colleague from Singapore. Unfortunately, in their universities, they can learn Korean, but it's not a major like we have here in Australia. But most students learning Korean in Singapore is almost all of them for enjoyment, fun, as a hobby, because they're attracted by the Korean wave. So you can see that depending on the country, the motivations are quite different. And what it has been found is that perhaps the Korean wave is a good motivator to attract students at the beginning to learn the Korean language. But on the long run, it is not as, as a good motivator to keep them going until they reach high proficiency level. And I think this is perhaps the problem that people like Shinji and myself, we have to fix, to try to sort out now. How can we keep students motivated to learn Korean beyond the basic level? And that's a challenge, not just for us here at Uni Melbourne, but for probably anybody teaching Korean all over the world. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others, Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Air to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Sammy Shah, and I'm joined by Korean Studies researchers Dr. Shin Chi Chong and Dr. Nicola Fraschini, both of Asia Institute. We're talking about who's learning the Korean language outside Korea and what motivates them. Nicola, how is the South Korean government investing in the promotion of Korean languages and culture abroad worked out? What role do institutions like the Sejong Institute play and how do they compare to initiatives like China's Confucius Institutes? The Korean government has been pouring a lot of money in Korean language education overseas. That's undeniable. But there are two caveats to this. The first one is that compared to other Asian languages, investments from the Korean government came relatively late, which means that it didn't happen in the 90s. In the 70s, 80s, 90s, for example, Japanese government was putting a lot of money in, in Japanese language education. But if you think of the situation of the 90s in Korea, with the death of Kim Il-sung in North Korea, and the Asia market's financial crisis in 1997, the Korean government was not in a position to be able to put money, as much money as needed, overseas. And also, overall, the international atmosphere surrounding Korea, where you never know whether a war can break out at any moment. So it was not the right atmosphere to pull funding. That came a bit later. I think that the Sejong Institute is one way that the Korean government develop to fund and to support Korean language overseas. The problem with the King Sejong Institute is that the Sejong Institute works much as a size fits all, while on the other hand, as Shinji and I have pointed out repeatedly, the diaspora, the learners, the motivation, that is different country by country, context by context, and there is not one size fits all approach that can work. Nicola, what are the main avenues available for learning Korean outside of Korea, such as universities or language schools? And, and how widespread are these? And do they have adequate funding? Oh, it depends on the country. 
in Western countries like in Europe or in Australia, Korean is probably available through Korean community schools that Shinji mentioned. And I noticed that in Australia, Korean community schools are more and more introducing courses for adults learners, not just for children. And those courses are mostly aimed to the parents of multicultural families when there is a Korean wife and an Australian husband. So those classes are usually attended by the Australian husband who wish to learn Korean. So in Australia, we have, as I said, the Korean community schools and the universities. And we also have three King Sejong institutes, one in Sydney, one in Adelaide, and one in uh, recently created in Perth. And beyond that, I know that in big centers such as Melbourne or Sydney, you can also find Korean private schools. The situation is different in other countries, I said. For example, if I think of Europe, it's more likely that you just have university, Sejong institutes and community schools available, not many private schools. But if you go to Southeast Asia, there where you find a lot of private schools teaching Korean. So again, there are a lot of avenues that you can use to learn Korean, but it could be that depending on where you live, not all of them might be available. And also what might not be available is the resources. So if you need textbooks, if you need material, is that available in your language? And is that available in your area? So now with YouTube, you know that there is a lot of educational content in many different language, languages that people can access to. But if you talk about the traditional paper textbooks, some people still like them, like myself, you can see that there is a lot published in English. There is a lot published in Chinese and Japanese. But you need like big institutions with large government fundings, such as the Sejong Institute we mentioned before, if you want to have a book translated into a myriad of other languages spoken in, in Asia and across the world. Shenqi, how does Korean fare as a language study in Australian universities then, compared to other Asian languages like Japanese or Chinese? Uh, well, it's a difficult question to answer again. Late last year, language educators and those working in the areas of Korean studies have had a small a meeting and discussed the issues surrounding the Korean education in Australian schools and universities. And at that meeting, I've mentioned generally, uh, Korean is viewed or considered to be more difficult to learn than Japanese or Chinese. But I have recently looked up another information piece of information that was published by the Foreign Language Institute. So for English language native speakers, Japanese is actually assessed or evaluated as the most difficult language to learn. But what I want to point out is that at least at the beginner's level, I'd say Japanese might feel easier to access because, you know, there's no sound that's difficult to pronounce for English native speakers. And also once you learn a set of hiragana and katakana, you can basically, you know, start reading. And the level of difficulty regarding grammar, Japanese and Korean might be quite comparable, I would say. But when you reach the intermediate level, I would say the kanji problem kicks in. Many students actually found a very difficult to keep up with the verging uh, list of vocabulary that they have to learn uh, with kanji. So I say maybe at the beginning, uh, English native speakers might feel that Japanese is much easier. But when you actually advance to the intermediate level, I say Korean can be maybe easier. How does learning Korean outside of Korean speaking environments then affect language acquisition particularly regarding cultural context. Do heritage learners have an advantage? I think that there are many variables that kick in when people need to move from the beginners through the intermediate to the advanced level. If we talk at, about our case in Australia, not just the University of Melbourne, those variables can be, for example, the degree structure, can be the motivation of the student. It could be the availability of teaching material at the advanced level. It could be 
larger language education or education funding government policies. So there are so many variables that kick in when people need to advance and continue their study, that language study. And we shouldn't forget that studying a language, unlike other things, is done one step after the other. It's not that I can take one subject before the other, like I can do with other subjects in my degree. You need to do language one before doing language two and so on. And this is a sequence which takes years to complete. Because in our case, after three years of our degrees, students might get an intermediate or a very low advanced level, but perhaps many of them cannot be still considered fully proficient. And that depends on the amount of class hours, which doesn't depend on us that we can teach Korean to the students. So there are many factors. And among one of them, I also want to go back to the motivation. If a student is interested in Korean culture, in reading the language, and perhaps in being able just in ordering a coffee when they go to Korea, they can do that like in one or two years with us, and they've already reached their goal. So the goal of the students at the very beginning might not be for all of them to become advanced and proficient speakers. Shinchi, what about heritage learners? Do they have an advantage? Uh, I would say yes to a certain extent. So these heritage learners, they usually are exposed to Korean when they are young, let's say, you know, since birth. So they have a huge advantage in terms of distinguishing the sounds that exist in Korean but doesn't exist in English. So they have basically mastered the sound system uh, when they're very young. And also, you know, if they were exposed to and were using the Korean language all the way up to just before starting school, they might have learned the basic grammar. And then on top of that, they have learned all those vocabulary that they use in everyday life. And if they continue using Korean, at least in some domains of life, at least with their parents, with their siblings and family members throughout their school age, obviously they cannot be compared with a second language or foreign language learner who start learning Korean from scratch. But it should be a very obvious one. But when these heritage speakers come to Korean language class, they also have some difficulties. For instance, some of them, it's not really the case for many heritage speakers in these days, but long ago, they actually haven't had the Korean literacy. So they have huge problems with you know, orthography, for example, and they tend to, you know, just write as if they were speaking. So if they were to to complete some kind of written composition task or something like this. So they face different, uh, you know, difficulties. Nicola, you've both spoken so much about the challenges with retention among those who start learning Korean. What factors contribute to learners discontinuing their studies entirely? And is there anyone who's more likely to persist and achieve fluency? I don't have strong data about this, but I would think that positive experiences with language learning at the low level can promote students keeping on going at the upper level. And what promotes a positive learning experience is not just the teacher, it's also the material that you use it. Do we have appropriate material that can support students' motivation to keep them going up to the advanced level? Do we have teachers that make class enjoyable and support learners to the uh, more advanced level? And then also on the other end, there is... The fact that, as Shinji mentioned, we cannot sugarcoat it. Korean is not easy. That's it. If you are an English-speaking background, Korean is not easy. But that doesn't mean that you cannot learn it. It's not easy to the same degree Chinese is not easy, that Arabic might be not easy, or Japanese is not easy. So people do learn it. The problem is to start at the beginning with the right expectations. We are in a world now that everything is much quicker than 20, 30 years ago. Everything is communicating much quicker and happens overnight. Unfortunately, language learning takes time and learning a difficult language takes even more time. So 
students might be supercharged at the very beginning of the first Korean language class and saying, I will study this until I'll be able to read classical Korean. I did have such a students in the past. And the same student, after four weeks, drop out of the course because they realized it was too hard. They underestimated the difficulty of the Korean language. And they thought they would have been able to learn it much quicker than they thought, than it is actually possible. So it is also a matter of being frank with the students and telling them, look, you won't be able to, to watch Korean dramas without subtitles within the next year and a half. That is not going to happen. And it is a matter of being frank and tell them, look, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. But if you look down the road three, four years, it's so rewarding. Well, that's an interesting strategy or best practice for those teaching Korean. What about some strategies for those learners on their journey towards fluency in Korean, especially those outside Korea, obviously? Well, in my case, if I have to remember my own learning experience, as I said, when I started learning Korean, it was well before YouTube, well before all the online resources that students can access now. I would tell to who wants to learn Korean is to make it their passion. And I'm not saying a full-time job, but learning Korean doesn't start and finish with the class time. If you want to learn it well, you need to put in effort well beyond the class time. What makes the difference is not what you do in the class as much as what you do outside of the class. Watch your dramas, listen to your music, find additional material, try to read out things. If you are passionate about translation, for example, you can give it a try translating your own things for your own pleasure or for your exercise. You have to put down your head in order to remember vocabulary. It's, it's really boring, but there is no way around it. Either you remember a word or you don't. So it's all this attitude to study outside of the class that I think it makes the difference. Shinji, would you like to add anything to that? So I can simply resonate with Nicola saying there's this time on task principle that applies to anything that you learn. That it means the more time you spend uh, on a task, the better you become it. And you should also ensure that your learning is effective. If you find what you are learning interesting and enjoyable, then your brain works in a way that enhances the effectiveness of your learning. So for instance, if your focus level increases, which helps you remember what you have learned later. So if you truly enjoy something, you are more likely to return to it. So therefore, these two things are very important to keep in mind when you learn Korean. So I'd say stay motivated and make your learning enjoyable. For both diaspora speakers and those who have gained fluency through learning, what steps can they take to keep their use of the Korean language robust and alive into the future then? Well, I would advise that the regular practice and, and use are the key, whether you are a heritage language speaker or foreign uh, or second language learner. So once the two things that I have mentioned, the time and task and the effectiveness of learning are in place, all you need to do is basically to learn, practice and use the language regularly. So it's similar to learning to play a musical instrument or a sport. So heritage language learning learners will have their family members, close by parents, siblings, or maybe even extended family members in Korea with whom they can actually use the language every day. And for foreign language learners, it might be harder, slightly harder to find someone to have regular conversations with in Korean. But in Australia, at least, there are many, many uh, international students from South Korea, as well as working holiday makers. So you can try to make friends with them. And as you know, these practices or you know, conversations don't have to take place in a physical space. You can always find a Korean friend online, no matter where you live. Nicola, I'll start with you and I'd like both of you to answer this. And in your opinion, what needs to change to better promote the learning and retention of the language globally then? What recommendations would you make to educators, policymakers, communities? I'm going to focus on Australia. 
as I said before, perhaps a switch in perception of a public opinion that Korean is not just a community language, but can be learned as people might want to learn French or Spanish or other languages. And then in particular for the Australian case, what could be done is to try to have more school, not just primary school, but also high school with a Korean language program. That would be great. And also schools that have a dual bilingual English-Korean program where some subjects are taught in English and some subjects are taught in Korean, as they do in some schools in, in primary schools in Victoria in one, and also they do in New South Wales and in Europe as well. And let's have a promotion campaign to support this shift in perception of a public opinion that Korean is not just for heritage Koreans. And then perhaps a last thing, one of the variables to retain and keep students and push them towards higher level could be locally developed material. So material that understand the context where these students have been learning. And so Australia locally developed Korean language material should be another effort that people like Shinji and us might want to concentrate on. Shinji, what about yourself? Any recommendations? Uh, I can just add a few things on what Nicola has already mentioned. Maybe one more aspect that policymakers, language educators should focus and try to share with or educate or make the public more aware of the importance of language learning. Just going back to the basic language education brings a deeper understanding between people as well as between cultures. So if we just try to expand more on that, maybe we can change the public's perception as well as the education policies as well uh, regarding not just the language education of Korean, but also all languages in general. I want to paraphrase what Professor Ross King mentioned in his interview for Melbourne Azure Review, which is that we need more funding. Korean large companies have not been funding Korean studies or the diffusion of Korean languages the way Japanese large companies have done in the past years. And the problem here to fix, he said in his interview, is that we can't expect students to join Korean classes just because of the Korean wave. So it's not that we can avoid funding Korean language because thanks to the Korean wave, students will learn it anyway, because the Korean wave, we don't know how long it's going to last. Thank you, Nicola and Shin Chi. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. Our guests have been Dr. Nicola Fraschini and Dr. Shin Chi Chong, both from Asia Institute. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on your socials. This episode was recorded on the 23rd of September 2024. Producers were Kelvin Param and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons Copyright 2024, the University of Melbourne. I'm Sammy Shah. Thanks for your company.